Hello, hello guys. Uh, welcome on the African Dream Facebook page. You've been uh, amazing all this year. Uh, and we are now 91,000 people following us on Facebook and, you know, just liking and sharing everything we're doing. On this special day, we want to say thank you. Thank you to you guys. And then we also have for our last um, live of 2022, a special guest. Um, so our guest today is originally from Senegal. Um, he has been nominated as one of the most uh, uh, influential 100 class of 2018 in politics and governance. He's a former chief of staff of the Office of Labor and Relation and Collective Bargaining in, um, in DC. And we are going to discuss uh, diaspora, diaspora involvement. How can we be stronger diaspora in the United States? And we're also going to talk about USA Africa from Mamadou. How are you today? Number, thank you very much. I'm doing very well. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join you and your audience. Uh, yeah, I'm doing very well. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you too. It's a pleasure to have you today. So you are, you know, I've, I've looked over your curriculum and your your resume, amazing resume. But what first brought you here in the United States? Yeah, so you know my uh, um, you know my journey here started with uh, uh, you know my father worked at the Senegalese embassy as a as part of the military attaché. You know back in the late nineties, um, and so I wouldn't say that I came because you know the typical immigrant story, right, which is to come to pursue an education or a, or better better economic opportunities for me i came because when i was younger i was always sick i suffered from chronic asthma and i was always uh, out of school because of of a sickness and so when my father was stationed here in dc it was an opportunity to come and get you know better, better health care <laughs> essentially it came down to that better health care treatment and so so i was <clears throat> i was also very young but so coming here for better healthcare also meant coming here for better education opportunities and ultimately better economic opportunities. So, you know, that that's that's what my journey, uh, that's how my journey started. I came in and then um I went straight into high school, like like many immigrants, and because my English wasn't the very best at the time, even though I was actually um in Senegal compared to the grade that I was in, I was probably college level, but you know, it was well advised that I spent a couple of years in high school, which I did, and that put me towards a path for, you know, getting a college opportunity and ultimately a uh, uh, pretty good uh, a career, I would say. So saying like that, you know, it kind of seems like a fairy tale, the guy who came from a diplomatic family, but, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds because I've, you know, researched a little bit on you and it looks like you had many difficult challenges that you faced growing up and just in, in order to find your space in this society. What were the major challenges that you faced uh, here in the U U.S., like trying to, you know, mix your way out in this country? No, I mean, you know, the, the challenges are, you know, they vary. Even even back home in Senegal, the challenges, as I said, was, was medical. You know, imagine being, suffering from chronic asthma and throughout the whole month, I will maybe be in school for maybe two weeks out of the month. So always missing wow. two weeks. Uh, I'm struggling to catch up. My friends were bigger and stronger than me. And so as we talk about bullying here, those are some of the things you face back home, right? You you know, the you know, the bullying, even though maybe yeah. that something exists back then, right? People try to show you that they're bigger and stronger than you. And so for me, you know, I was always the recipient of the, you know, of the aggression, right? Uh, and, but, you know, that became a source of motivation because to me, the I, I've always felt like I had something to prove. These guys that are bullying me, I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to show you what I can do. That always became the source of motivation. And when I came in the U.S., it's a different set of challenges. And it was more towards, you know, uh, getting acclimated, getting the opportunities, especially at, the, at some point when, you know, I, uh, you know, there was a period where I was undocumented and, and that comes with a different set of challenges, right? Yes. Getting to the legal path of immigration, having an opportunity because lacking the documentation doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily define you. And so you become very ambitious. You have a lot of goals. You have a lot of dreams. But because you don't have the legal status, it sort of limits you a little bit. And so that exactly. was one of the challenges 
and obviously going, you know, when I when I went to college, uh, I had a, 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 you know, not a full scholarship. I had some financial support, but I had to figure out the remaining seventy five percent of the of the cost to go to college. I had to figure it out. So that means I had to work two jobs in college. I I was on a soccer team, so that meant I had to not only fulfill my academic responsibility, but the, but the sports are responsible, but also working in the afternoon on the weekends to be able to pay for your for your books, for your food, for the typical the typical things that you need to go to college. And having doing all of that without any parents paying for your support, it's just you and your your immediate family, which in this case was my sisters who were with me. So those were some of the challenges that I faced. But again, all of those looking back were things that really made me who I am. Like having gone to college in four years by yourself, and now what I tell people is, whenever there's a new challenge that that faces me, I look back at how I dealt with all of the challenges that I dealt with since I was, you know, four or five. And if I'm able to overcome all of those at this point, there isn't a lot of challenges that I'm not able to overcome. That's 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 amazing. It sounds like the perfect American dream. Like, can you can you say that you are living the American dream? Like, I, I feel like it's a cliche, but at the same time, a lot of people just hear about the American dream. They think it's something easy, but you know, but you show that you know your experience shows that it was not an easy start, and you have to struggle. I even heard some of your some of your stories where you tried it, like you you were playing soccer. And you moved to a different place, you know, trying to, you know, be a soccer player. It turned out, you know, the guy who made you come to that place wanted you to to, to study and get more degrees. Like, can we say that the American easy is easy? The American dream is easy to reach, or you know, it's 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 a struggle. Like, yeah, maybe most of the thing in life. It's it's not easy to reach. That's why you know it's called uh, an an American dream. And you know, you have to understand what the term dream means in this context it's not a typical dream you know you go to bed and you, you know, it's, it's a it's, it's something that's abstract right it's not something that you can touch and feel and that's it's not something that's close up front it's something that's further out right you don't necessarily know what it looks like you know and so you have to define it it has to be what you want it to be what the american dreams means to me may be different for what it means to you for somebody else it may mean a lot of money you know, for the typical, you know, the way it's defined here is the, you know, it's the, you know, the 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 middle class with a white fence and a family with, you know, two kids and a dog. That's that is the typical definition. But you know, as us Africa, when we come here, the Afri the American dream is really in many different ways an African dream. It's just that <laughs> you you are living it here in the US. And for me, the American dream is, you know. I don't know if that's what I'm pursuing, but I'm just I'm waking up every day. I'm pursuing what my passion is. I I, I go to work, I come back, I'm I'm here with my family. But outside of work and family, I try to figure out passions that I'm things that I'm passionate about, either supporting my community here in the DMV. Uh I'm not part of any associations, I'm not a president of any association. I'm a I'm a lone wolf, you know, I go into <laughs> on my own. But I tap into the resources that I have to support the community as much as I can, but as as discreetly as I can, without all the noise and all of the uh, the the, you know the you know all of the fanfare around that. I'm sure that's you know that's a discussion that you know made a lot of people uh, be interested in you. I received a lot of messages. People wanted to learn more about uh, about yourself, and here you are after all these challenges. Um, you know, you served as chief of staff. Uh, the Office of Labor Collective Bargaining. Um, like, how did you manage to, you know, to get that position? Was it was it was it easy? Like, how 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 did you end up, you know, working, you know, for the office? It's it's obviously an amazing and a prestigious position. No, I mean, you know, you know, on my on my on my on my regular, you know, I've I've worked for DC government for twelve years. Uh, you know, I came into DC in two thousand eleven through a fellowship that I that I applied for a very competitive uh, uh, interview process. Uh, I remember when I came for my interview, there were 92 people being interviewed wow. for six positions. Oh my and, God. Uh, this is a, a three-day interview where, you know, you do 
you sit on a panel and then you do a writing assignment, then you do a presentation. And so it's highly competitive. Wow. And you know, I was lucky enough to be selected. And that sort of put me on a course for a management track. And you know, you know, DC government with any many governments that are relatively the size of this one, you know, uh, things, you know, rumors go very fast. If you're good, everybody knows very fast. If you're bad, everybody knows it very fast. And so, you know, I happen to, I think, have displayed my my talent very well in whether it's effective, my leadership skills, my 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 ability to lead organizations and, you know, lead projects and implement projects and keep people accountable. That's essentially what it is. And, you know, even before I became the chief of staff in that agency, I was the director for the mayor's office of African affairs wow. for four years between 2015 and 2019. And if you know anything about that office, you will know that the mayor's office of African affairs in DC is the only office of African affairs in the entire United States that you find at the local level. That's and right. I led that for four years and, you know, put a lot of programs together to support the African community you know, instituted program like Mandela Day celebration. I'm the very first person who today DC celebrates that every year, July 18th, because of my my work. Uh, you know, nice. you know, set up, you know, forums and summit for African youth, develop coding academies, even we even produce a film <laughs> to highlight the wow. diaspora community in DC. And so after doing that for four years, you know, sometimes job opportunities come across and Sometimes your name gets mentioned, sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, I've been lucky enough that my name has been mentioned a few times in, in either chief of staff role or deputy director role in bigger agencies. And, you know, um, you know, I, I show up. And, and your name was also uh, on on a, on the panels during the USA Africa Summit, the, the, the recent USA Africa Summit in, in Washington, D.C. And obviously that's where we met, uh, you know, moderated one of the panel on education I was really, uh, you know, I was impressed. And um, so basically the USA Africa Summit, the, the, the US administration coming to invest, you know, $55 billion in top, different type of investment in Africa. What is your take on that summit? So my take is, you know, it was a, it's a good start from where we left off eight years ago from the last summit. Um, there's a lot of commitment, but it's a commitment, right? There's a lot of pledges, but it's, it's a pledge, you know, a yes, pledge a is, I'm going to, you know, do this A, B, C, and D, which is, which is great. Uh, but, you know, at this point, you know, we need more, you know, more action is needed. And you're right, I, I was lucky enough to have been invited by the State Department to take part in this summit. That's only because the organization that I lead, which is the, the Pan-African Institute of Municipal Development, is an organization that is timely in terms of where the continent is going, but also in terms of the, the, the conversation that happened during the summit. We created, I founded this organization in 2020, but you know, this organization is founded based on 15 years of experience at a local level. You know, I spent almost 13 years in DC government. I spent, you know, two, three years in the city of Atlanta. And in 15 years of experience in local government, you know, my my vision was how can we leverage this experience to support African municipal governments with capacity building, technical assistance and leadership development. And even in those 15 years, I've always supported African countries, Senegal in particular, uh, in, in, in different ways. For example, they will always bring mayors here in DC for training. Typically, they call me before they come. Or when they come, they call me and say, we're here for training. Can you, you know, help us find this? Maybe we need to be trained on this particular topic. And I dig into my network and I find experts to come and support that, that training. Um, and, you know, even in, in that role of, in African affairs, supporting other, you know, African governments, you know, to the, the embassies in here. And so I created this organization in many different ways, many of the things that we're being talked about, how can the diaspora contribute to the development of African countries? How do we reverse brain drain? All of those is being done to our organization right now, because right now we are working directly with African governments, the mayors at the local level, and we are helping those mayors with capacity. Essentially, we are, we are saying that a municipal government in African, in any African country is like a company. And the mayor is like a CEO. Like a CEO. So it's like the CEO focuses on the bottom line, which is, you know, revenue, whether it is, 
you know, profit of a million dollar, $10 million, we are saying that the mayor also need to focus on their bottom line. And the bottom line in Africa, in governments is the quality of service, the people that you serve. And so we, we are providing them with training. For example, last September, we brought a delegation of 15 mayors from Senegal to DC. Yes. And we developed a partnership with George Washington University. We developed a curriculum tailored to, to mayors around public private partnerships, right? Around leadership and ethics, financial management, transparency, right? In, in the, at the same time, we, we work with the World Bank where they did a three hour session with us in the mayors on how to put together projects that the World Bank eventually support. That's a point. We a platform for them to sit with the mayor of Baltimore, who's one of the youngest mayors in the US at the time that he was elected, to have a conversation with them around how the pandemic, for example, changed municipal government. And so these are some of the things that we're doing. At least this is my way of contributing back to the African continent. Amazing. And, and, and so this is one of the reasons why we were asked to, to join the summit, and um, which was a good opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing. I mean, I also wanted to expand a little bit more on the PIMD, which is the Pan-African Institute of Municipal Development, uh, the nonprofit organization that you are the executive director of later on. But, you know, and it was good to give us that background of <laughs> what led to you being part of the panelists and the moderator during this summit. Uh, so back to this uh, this summit obviously the the Biden administration showed that they have some type of interest towards the Af toward Africa and the diaspora but uh you know a lot of people don't really know what the African diaspora represent in the US like are we a strong diaspora are we in terms of quality and quantity like the for example the Indian diaspora like from your experience what do you think of the African diaspora are we organized are we can we be like a force a, you know, I know we send yeah. a lot of money back home, but like, how can we become a, like a, a strong, strong group of like influencing U.S. policy in this country? Sure, the, the African diaspora is strong in terms of numbers. Okay. In other words, you know, when you look at the number of African immigrants here, they are now about 1.6 million in the U.S. overall, maybe more if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But the last census numbers that I checked was about 1. Three and I'm guessing with the time pandemic is is grown a little bit. So, 1.6 to be on the safe side with a you know an error margin of maybe three uh, percent. So we are strong in terms of numbers. When you break it out even further, you will see the Nigerian diaspora is 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 more is, is there's more Nigerians and then you look at the, and then the Ghanaians and then the Ethiopian. And so we are strong here in terms of 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 of, uh, of numbers. We are also strong in terms of a collective remittances that are going back on the continent, if you look at that. But I wouldn't say that we are strong in, 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 a, in a way to, to change policy. On one hand, we are because, you know, you can see so many Africans are not getting elected into leadership, you know, um, elected position, whether it is in Congress, in state houses where policy is made, decision is made. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Actually, was looking so, at so, so, yeah. so you see that, but but on the flip side, I, I think we are weak in the U.S. because we're not really structured. Okay. There isn't a formal African diaspora organization yes. led by Africans that is funded by is a um, is what a, that is is a membership base or sort of a you know contribute money to the cause you don't see that you see these yeah. small scale organizations that are not very strong that are not very structured and the impact isn't really known and their focus is just focus on if it's an ethiopian organization the focus is just ethiopians right yes. if it's Ghanaian, it's just Ghanaian. if it's senegalese it's just senegalese mm -hmm. it's never it's never Ghanaians, you know you know supporting you know an initiative that ethiopians and togolese or and so in that sense, it's, it's very weak in, in many different ways. Um, but, you know, we, we try to do some work around this. I A couple of years ago, I started this initiative in the DMV. I went and visited many of our African brothers and sisters in Maryland. And I visited some in, in Virginia. And I said, let's create a regional African diaspora uh, uh, um, committee in, in the DMV made up of all of us, right? And we'll 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 create an organization where it's chaired by the leaders, and we'll have committees, and we'll try to find causes to support 
But you know, that didn't go anywhere. And so what's left is, you know, everybody's doing their own thing. What, what, yes. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. Like, for example, at some point I figure, well, PIMD is what I'm going to do. And and while I'm doing this, Denver, you may be doing something else. Somebody else is doing something else. And maybe that's the that's the equation here. And it, it and it's working. It's working. We just we cannot dismiss. We cannot be under the impression that unless we do something collectively, we're not doing anything, right? Okay. And and so I, I think this is the what we find yeah. to be the best way to contribute, and we should support that. I mean, I I think it's a great way to contribute uh, separately. But we always hear about African unity, but we can't. Like it, it seems like it's tough for us to be united in one thing. Uh, and then at the same time, we see other community like the Jewish community or other community having strong, you know, unique lobbying group, like, you know, where they can influence policies in the Senate and then in, in governments where they can, you know, their voice can be heard because most of us uh, are you, like, like US citizens at the same time hold different African citizenship. So it, it's sad to see how we're not, united like not at all of us but at least you know we're not a group a strong group um that can impact on u.s policy especially on events like usa africa summit where we hear about uh many many billions being dispersed to african continents but uh, i really appreciate your analysis on that and i i want to also learn more about the timd so you you had this great experience from municipal um, uh, governments, and then you decided, you know, like you said, it's your way to contribute. You decided to create this nonprofit organization. And for for, for those who don't know, um, can you tell us, you know, a little bit about that organization? What was the thought process to come up with this uh, with this nonprofit organization? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, again, so this idea, to be honest with you. Um, so this was created in 2020 during the pandemic when you know you had a lot of time at home. <laughs> but in reality, the concept I've been working on for the past eight years, close to 10 years. Uh, I remember in 2012, I spoke to some friends who came from Senegal for training here and I presented them this concept back, back then in 2012. And so slowly they started working on it to develop it to sort of think about um, you know how to get it done but the time it was never correct but at some point you know the pandemic was an opportunity for different things as you can see a lot of people created use it to innovate right there's a lot of a uh, new thing that happened businesses closed no one created and so for me it was the time that i needed to just sit down and get it done and so you know at some point i just you know took some time for work and i focused close to a month of doing nothing but this right you're waking up early in the morning going to bed really late to develop the concept to write the executive summary to write the concept from start to finish on what do we want this organization to do what are our objectives which is we said three objectives capacity building technical assistance and leadership development directly supporting african municipal governments which we believe are the municipal governance are the building blocks of oh, governance yeah. government is local Mm -hmm. and so if local governance isn't strong, then everything else gets impacted. And so that's what we did. Uh, and, you know, we developed the organization, recruited a board. We have a very strong board members, right? Identify program that we can do. And then we just started to reach out to organizations in Senegal, different African countries, and to share our concept. And very fast, it, it, it caught on. And, you know, people are interested in, in what we're doing. And... Um, you know, we invited a couple of mayors in in DC in September. Um, worked really well. George Washington University, which is a major university, doesn't just work with anybody. And George Washington is not going to agree to train people and give them a certificate with George Washington's name without the partner is being really credible. And this is something that, that I'm very uh, uh, proud uh, proud of. And um, you know, and and you know. Very short after that, we, we got a significant amount of funding from the U.S. government to say, we like what you guys are doing here. Can you do it in Guinea-Bissau? We said, yes, say, hey, go do it in Guinea-Bissau. Wow. When you're done okay. in Guinea-Bissau, can you do it in Senegal? We said, yes, say, hey, go do it in Senegal. And so we're getting ready to launch our inaugural good governance practice program in Guinea-Bissau. We're actually going to do two, two sessions there. 
when we're done in Guinea Bissau, we're going to go to Senegal, do two more sessions. And so what we are saying now to African countries like Senegal and Guinea Bissau is that if the US government uh, believes in us to the point where to give us money, funding to come implement in Senegal, you should always, you should also believe in us yes. and give us the support that another government is giving us right to do the same thing in in those countries and so hopefully they're listening and uh, i wouldn't say no to the to the support if they if they offer so so if you are um you know a mayor or a governor watching us from sierra leone or from by the way we have someone from sierra leone abubakar who's actually uh saying hi he admires you and he wants to know the secret behind your success i mean you can definitely uh talk about that if there's any but uh if you are in Africa and, you know, and you need uh, training for your agent, and, you know, for you as a mayor or as, uh, you know, a governor or anything, you know, someone who, you know, run a city, uh, Mama de Samba has this, uh, has created PIMD to help uh, for that purpose. Uh, and, and I think it's it's a great way to kind of give back because it's not only, we can only, we can give back in different ways. Like you can give back with money, your knowledge, your experience, and definitely, is doing that with his knowledge. So uh, I'm just going to add another question on top of uh, our viewer question, what is your secret? So that question is, um, so what, what, what do you think of um, the challenges? Like what is keeping African um, cities from developing? Is it corruption based on your experience? Is it corruption or is it like bad leadership? What What, what, what is your... Uh, what can you tell us about that based on your experience? Because you, you're meeting those people, you're training them. Um, and why African cities are not, are not well, the whole thing, you know? You know, the, you know, people typically like to just point to corruption is, is one reason, right? But there's, there's corruption here in the U.S. You know, there, there's corruption everywhere. There's corruption in places that you don't even imagine. So in, when it comes to African countries, <laughs> we have to understand it's not just corruption. Yes, corruption is part of it. It's an important part of it. But it's also the leadership is, is part of it. But leadership is very, very, very broad, right? When you say leadership is failing, you know, it. there's a logic in putting that. But for me, one of the reasons why it's not developed is just the way our our, our countries are structured. Mm -hmm. it, it's, 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 and, and the point here is that many of our countries, almost all of them are national governments. They are not, they are not federal governments. In other way, it's... it's it's the president who controls all the money and there, there's everybody else. And so, you know, at the local level, you know, one of the problems is that the autonomy to levy tax, which is, this is something that I talked about during the summit, which is if I'm a mayor, I need to have the order to levy taxes in my own locality. Another need to do the same thing and another need to do the same thing. And the, the taxes that you levy, that creates opportunity to innovate new opportunity like for example now you see in the in dc medical marijuana is one new you know tax source right you know wow. it's, it's a new it's a new industry and so as you know if these if locally people don't have the autonomy to create new industries to levy taxes to spend it independently um it limits them for the most part they the taxes flow to the top and that's divided up to different ministerial organization and maybe gets down to the law in senegal you can see for example it's just uh, there's a very small portion that the mayors get and that that portion only allows you to pay for salary it doesn't yeah. allow you to invest in no areas it doesn't allow you to do much except for just pay taxes so to me the fact that we are we are national governments rather than federal government creates barriers there isn't a lot of uh, uh, competitivity for example there isn't a lot of competition between government and government need to need to compete with one another. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I take the example of Senegal. You know, we have I don't know how many regions, and if every region was independent, given funding to to innovate independently or provide some competitive funds to allow governors to compete, to allow governors to go and attract a business to come settle in a region versus another, you have to create that opportunity to to compete. Right. That when whenever there's competition, the quality of service is 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 best. And so, but that's at the local level. But you know, there are a lot of reasons why we're not able to to develop many of it. You know, we still suffer from colonial uh, 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 rule. 
you know, if you look at, you know, urbanism, the way we live, many of the houses were built before college. And so we never really went back and started from scratch. We continued from where we left off. And, you know, the leadership we have isn't always the best type of leadership. You have typical leaders who come in and they want to worry about, you know, it's, it's, it's politics. It's never, it's never a program. It's never uh, um, fixing an issue. We come after 50 years, we still have the same problem. And so for me, there's a lack of will, I think. Uh, there's, there's a lack of will for sure. But there's also, there's also, you know, the lack of accountability in many different ways. You know, if you mentioned corruption earlier, and today you see many people who are accused of, you know, uh, stealing funds, really nothing happens to them. And so at the end of the day, it just becomes more of the same. And we end up with, a, you know, where we started even after 25, 30 years. And I'm sure with our proper training and proper ruling and regulations and laws, I think most of the city can overcome because you see how the cities here are structured, how, you know, the state doesn't interfere with the, 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 the federal. Everything is organized in a way like each party benefits from uh, the, the taxes that they levy in and then they get to develop and, and just give right. back to the community for any type of services. I, I really think uh, there's a lot to learn from that system. Uh, and then people like you are definitely the right people to go to to learn more about that and just implement it into our small cities and our big cities in Africa. Mama, it was an honor. It was a pleasure to have you today. I'm going to uh, leave you the floor for a last word to our young African uh, viewers that are watching this, uh, or our young leaders uh, that are watching this, because they were also invited into that summit. Because everybody know, I mean, everybody know, maybe not Africans enough, that Africa has a strong and uh, growing, um, like, like um, um, power. Like the youth, African youth, constitute a big, big, big. Like everybody want to tap on that, uh, and I, I want you to have an opportunity to give them a message and share with them maybe what Abubakar asked, your secret, <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. and the last word. Thank you. Well, thank you for, you know, Demo, this is a great conversation, you know, to, to answer Abubakar's question. I, I don't know, you know, the, the success, the secret to my success, I don't know, I don't think I'm successful. I, I don't even see myself as being successful. I see myself as, and anybody who knows me will tell you this, I don't, I'm always going after something. Like, I don't, I may I may not get it, uh, and most of the time I don't get what I go after. But one thing that makes me unique is I don't I don't give up. I'm I'm always, <laughs> you know, I fall. I'm always up again. I'm always up all the time. I'm persistent. I'm very persistent with what I do. Uh, you know, that's not bragging. Uh, but you know, you may not get it all the time. But I'm I never stop trying to go. To, and to me, that's the key here, right? never stop trying sometime you know today is a good day right the, december 31st and you have a lot of people who last year made a new year's uh um you know what was it a, a new year's commitment that this year i'm going to join the gym this year i'm going to do this but you know most of the time they don't do it they they they, they make a commitment they started maybe in january by February, they stop and they never go back to it. And so my advice is, if you have something you always wanted to do, you know, do it. And, and you know, it's not, you know, don't even, you know, there's a lot you don't know, but just take it one day at a time, one day at a time. And, you know, sometimes you hit a brick wall, maybe that's the time to take a pause, step back, think about it, come back, but always keep going after it. And that's what my advice is. And uh, yeah, uh, so thank you, Dembo, for this. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, brother. Yeah. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you. Always All keep right. going, never stop, be persistent. I think that's yeah. the secret. We're ending with this great word of wisdom for 2022. Happy New Year, guys. Please like, share, follow us, and enjoy, enjoy your family. Enjoy whatever you have left. Thank you so much. Bye.